Okay, so, uh, you know, I guess I'll start with a joke. By raising hands, who, who's excited about Maui? We can't see each other, so probably no one's raising their hand. But uh, I have to say, in preparing for this, I've become super excited for this to release. In fact, it's got to go live right now, <clears throat> and there's a couple of projects coming up that I feel like maybe we should do it this way. Um, it's a super neat technology. I'm very pleased with how awesome the experience is already. Okay, <clears throat> so what are we going to cover? What is MAUI? How to port existing Xamarin code to MAUI? Starting up a new app? The debugging experience? And there's this interesting thing with MAUI and Blazor that we will cover. Uh, I can't uh, pretend to fully understand it yet, but I'll give you all the information I've figured out through research so far. Okay, so what is MAUI? Um, it stands for Multi-Platform App UI. <clears throat> it is, I, I said in here, it's the evolution of Xamarin Forms. And there's a nuance there. There's Xamarin and then there's Xamarin Forms. Xamarin Forms was the cross-platform portion of Xamarin where uh, the UI is rendered natively on each platform. It turned out to be such a good idea. That's kind of the uh, underpinnings for MAUI. <clears throat> Uh, MAUI is also multi-platform, includes iOS, Android, Mac OS, Windows, and also, not pictured here, Tizen, which is kind of cool. Uh, it allows all these to be done in a single project, whereas before you had to have a project for each of the platforms, and then kind of a, window, uh, sorry, a Xamarin Forms project to kind of tie it all together. Um, and then... Hot reloadability, we've had hot reload in Xamarin Forms for a little while, but this is a little better. <clears throat> Apps run natively and fast. And like I said earlier, there's a go live license for it. So let's talk more about uh, how this stuff works. So I've got these steps over here, one, two, and three. So uh, one is your, our app code can use MAUI. And if that's the only dependency we have, then that's fine. Uh, two, there's nothing stopping us, just like in Xamarin uh, forms, there's nothing stopping us from actually calling platform native code either. So if we need to do that for some reason, we can still do that. We can go right past the MAUI framework and just call straight into a, a native API platform. And then lastly, <clears throat> MAUI consumes the native platform. So really there should be a three here, 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 and here. Um, but this is just an abstraction. I put a kind of funny little quote on the end. One level of abstraction is indistinguishable from magic, which I thought I heard someplace, but I couldn't find the original source to attribute it to anyone. So I guess it can be attributed to me. <laughs> <clears throat> but this is providing a level of abstraction on top of these platforms. The base class library is also providing some abstractions between uh, the platforms, but um, between the MAUI UI stuff and the base cl platform library, base, base class library, <clears throat> we are able to run on any of the platforms, which is kind of cool. Okay, so when they say single project, like I said before, there used to be, uh, we had not just one project, but a project for all the probably main stuff, like all the forms and pages and co components and things go in, in one. And then we'd have, you know, myapp.android, myapp.ios, myapp.uwp, whatever else. So um, <clears throat> with MAUI, we no longer need to do that. And this is taken off their website. And in real life, you'll see it doesn't look quite as neat and quite as clean as all that. Uh, like there's no, you know, fancy icons or whatever. But the idea here <clears throat> is that if I'm compiling on Windows, I am going to get the Windows version of this file. And all the rest of these files in the other platform folders, those are ignored. There we go. And um, if I were to... to Compile on Android, same thing. This Android version of this Bluetooth adapter is going to be included, and the others are simply not even compiled. So that's 
kind of the the main idea behind how to how it works. Um, and like I said, you'll see more in a second and when we go through this. But um, another kind of thing to keep in mind is there's a lot of stuff we can share in here. Uh, it used to be all those resources had to be in each of the projects or uh, some, some kinds of resources could be just in the project. But like things like app icons and things like that, no, those had to be in each of the individual projects. Now all the resources are shareable. Um, <clears throat> and this uh, manifest I'm talking about, I'll, I'll show you more about that when we get there. Um, yeah, any, any kind of assets though are shared and then uh, platform specific code, that's the idea behind the slide. Another way we kind of do uh, cross-platform is that if, uh, preprocessor directive, there we go, the if, else if, preprocessor directives. If we're compiling for Android, then this line here, it will work or be active. The others will not be. Uh, but if we're on one of these other platforms, they're all active. That's kind of the idea is we can use this style. I don't particularly like the uh, if style of things. I'd prefer to just have a copy of it lived in the platform native stuff. But, you know, teach their own. And if there's a couple of lines you need to do, it's probably not a big deal. Okay, one of the things that kind of gets asked a lot, even when the Xamarin forms, is what if we want to create a custom component? So I've got this example of a really fancy, shiny button. Will I have to make this component on every platform? The answer is tricky, but probably not. So um, there is a cross-platform graphics API that underpins this all. And that cross-platform graphics API is pretty pretty sweet. It's got blending, it's got uh, font, it's got shapes, it's got you know vector stuff. It's it's really quite amazing. So um, I think you absolutely could pull off this button just exactly as it is and make it 100% from cross-platform code. Um, also, this code we can make to be styled via resource dictionary. And this surprised me, but I guess it shouldn't, but it still does. Um, we can use a CSS sheet to style our MAUI apps. And that CSS actually gets compiled to a resource dictionary. <laughs> so <clears throat> I don't, I kind of hope this doesn't become real popular because I think it's better if you just learn to deal with the resource direct, uh, dictionaries directly. But it's kind of interesting to note that you can use style sheets in your uh, MAUI code. Um, there's gesture recognizers for other things, uh, and these components can, can be published to NuGet. They can be self-contained, ready to go for anyone to consume. Okay, so <clears throat> the story with Blazor is kind of interesting. In a way, it happens just as you would expect, but in another way, you didn't expect that. So let me just kind of go through some of these points. Um, we can host a Blazor component or a Blazor page or even an entire Blazor website <clears throat> inside of our MAUI app. We do this, uh, we accomplish this by using something called a Blazor web view. And that Blazor web view works with our styling. So if we're in a, a flex grid and we say a Blazor web view and it'll all just kind of happen. <clears throat> and the first thing you might think is that maybe uh, this is running still on the server. No, it does not require internet access. It's all running on that device. <clears throat> In fact, the only reason we have a web view is because remember Blazor uh, content code generates HTML. So the, the, uh, the web view is simply to render that HTML, but the HTML is actually generated natively. We're not running WebAssembly on the back end. We're not requiring internet connection. Um, it does do some resource requests, but those are served up locally. So if I have like a style sheet, it'll request it at 0.0.0.0 slash styles.css. And that's just kind of handled by the framework. <clears throat> 
Uh, the browser dev tools can be loaded. Um, but yeah, the, the your Maui app and everything inside that Blazor web view all run together in the same process. In fact, you can even p invoke into the code from the code behind. So it's kind of an interesting thing that it's running the Blazor code natively, rendering it into a specialized web view, uh, and we're able to use it and interact with it on the Maui app side. So it's kind of a neat little use case we have there. I don't know if I plan to use that or not, but it's still cool, right? So this is not a web browser. You're saying a specialized web view. Is that something like uh, Electron would be? I would say yes, except for it's not running the code behind inside the browser. It's running the code behind natively in your app. So like I said, I think the web view is simply just a view that's going to display the HTML that your app rendered. Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. Okay, so I don't know how many have uh, existing Xamarin code. I've got a whole bunch at this company as we use Xamarin quite a lot. So the question I had was how hard is it to port existing Xamarin code to Maui? Um, so some answers on online so far appear to be not too bad. Uh, you don't have to merge all the projects into a single project. You can instead just say, okay, well, this is a Maui project and it only references uh, Android, but it's using this other um, project with all the components and pages and stuff, just kind of like we have organized now. There are some code changes that have to be done though. The biggest one is uh, updating the namespaces and converting the projects. You have to convert the projects, update the namespaces and reference the different NuGet packages. Um, <clears throat> that might cause trouble with other NuGet packages, so you'll have to look at, into those and then see if there's any breaking changes, see if it runs, right? Um, they are working on an upgrade assistant. It's really not released yet. And what, they'll, what they say about it is it'll get you most of the way there. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously there's going to have to be some manual work and a little bit of labor to get those ported. Okay, let me show you some navigation stuff. <clears throat> so I have navigation and I kind of have an in parentheses shell because the shell does navigation a bit differently than if you were to try and use the navigation directly. Um, and it's trying to do this abstraction such that you can use it kind of like you would use URLs. So you can kind of notice in this register section here, we've got several URLs looking things. And so this one's, you know, monkey's details. When we define this as well, we could put in the name of, you know, whatever page here, if that's, if we so desire, but it's just looking for a string and it's going to route based on that string. So uh, if some in some other page, we say shell, which unfortunately shell.current is a singleton. <laughs> I really wish Microsoft would learn their lessons and not use singletons. Uh, I will also caveat that I don't think this is the best way to do it, but uh, shell.current and then go to async. And we're gonna pass in you know this path and we're gonna be able to go to you know, wherever that's registered, which I guess I don't have that registered. <laughs> and if I do a dot dot, that means I want to go back. <clears throat> um, I can pass data to the caller. So same way we do with the URL. And <clears throat> the way that works is we can either on our class, we can add a class based attribute saying that anything of the name name is bound to property name and anything of location is bound to property location. So uh, here's that name of name. This is it guy. This is it here. This value would be put into here because it matches this value, right? Alternatively, you can create an apply query attributes um, method takes an i dictionary of string and object and you can do you know query whatever is whatever so there's a couple different ways you can do this um, but it is kind of interesting to note that it will take um, 
sophisticated types if we need. Okay. Navigation without shell is a lot more like you would expect with Xamarin Forms. In fact, navigation with shell is exactly <laughs> a lot like you'd expect with Xamarin Shell. But, um, you know, here we've got some basic stuff, push async. So this pushes this new page two onto the navigation stack because you think of, you visualize navigation as a stack. So we're going to push a new page onto the top of the stack because that's what's going to be visible. And then, or we can pop off something from the stack or we can tell it to pop all the way back to root. Um, and there's other th things we can do. Navigation though uh, is fortunately not a singleton. It's just a property given to anything that inherits from view. Also worth noting that there's something called a navigation page that works a little bit differently than shell and using the navigation components directly. But anyway. Okay, so to get started, you would need to install Visual Studio 2022 Preview. You'd need to make sure that Maui workload is checked. Uh, if you plan to run on Windows, and I suggest that you do for debugging purposes, you'll need to enable dev mode for Windows. Uh, if you're wanting to run Android emulator, you'll have to accept the EULA and you'll have to set up a virtual device. I'll show, uh, I've already been through the setup, so I'll show you just kind of running it. Uh, if you want to run an iOS simulator, you can, but you need a Mac. You'll need to create a connection to the Mac. And unfortunately, <clears throat> um, there's a problem with the M1 Macs in that we can't uh, cast the iOS simulator back to a Windows device like you could before. So unfortunately, <clears throat> for our build Mac anyway, uh, if I want to see this run, I have to go out my office to the other office, <laughs> wake up the computer, log in, and then I can see the simulator with my Maui code. I did actually do that to make sure it was working though. So <laughs> you'll have to take my word for it today, but I did try it. Okay, so let's do a quick new app example. Um, so let me stop, oops, stop my presentation for a moment. Okay, so what we need is Visual Studio 2022 uh, Preview. Right there. And we're just going to say create new project. <clears throat> I'm going to filter here to Maui. And we're going to do a .NET Maui app. It's worth noting why we're here though. Um, first of all, you can see that Tizen support is here. Secondly, <clears throat> uh, there's a template for a Blazor app in Maui. And lastly, there's a class library, Maui class library, uh, which is where you would make like components that you would you know, want to share between projects or push on NuGet or something. So we'll just do that. <clears throat> we'll call it not to interfere. <clears throat> okay, and here we go. So before I run it, let's kind of look through it a little bit. Um, dependencies, you can see we've got a different this sets of dependencies for each platform. You see my NuGet packages filling in there. Um, you can add NuGet packages to one or a project reference to one or to them all. Nextly, I've got this platforms folder. Inside here we have the Android specific stuff, the iOS specific stuff, the Mac OS specific stuff, the Tizen specific stuff, and finally the Windows specific stuff. And what that looks like is kind of what you would expect. Um, 
first of all, this is the standard manifest that all Android applications require. So it makes sense for this to go in the Android specific. If there are any resources that are simply Android resources, then we can also put those here. But the application, the way it bootstraps, has to happen as a main activity. So it has a couple of classes here that are just to bootstrap the rest of the app. Same thing for iOS. We've got a couple of files here that just bootstrap our app for us. And then the info plist, which is analogous to the um, Android's manifest. And this is just a, uh, a plist for our iOS app. Mac also requires a plist and also has its own delegates. Tizen has a manifest of sorts. <laughs> uh, that's a different thing. And here's how it bootstraps in. And finally, Windows. Windows does have an app manifest, which does things like DPI awareness and whether or not we run as administrator, etc. Um, it's also got a package manifest and, of course, our main app.xaml. Okay, so that's the platform specific stuff. <clears throat> also, point out in the resources, these are these resources get compiled to all of the different platforms. So when I Compile for Android, I'm getting everything in here. iOS, same, yada, yada. Okay, so where the rubber really meets the road is, is back here in these. But once the bootstrap has happened, the next thing that kind of happens is we get this, um, this file called and we can start using our builders and configuring our stuff and then and then running. Um, this app is telling it that our main app is app. So if we F12 into that, this is saying that our main page is a new app shell. Here's app shell right here. So if we look at app shell, we can see it's just a shell with a little bit of shell content and it's referencing main page and main page is here. Um, I, I know I harp on this a lot and I'm going to do it again. <laughs> Please organize your files in these things uh, by where they belong taxonomic wise rather than what kind of thing they are. The problem we have with like MVC architecture, for example, we're putting all the models in the models folder, we're putting all the views in the views folder, except for uh, now I've got a view that's halfway up my solution, pull, uh, being bound to a model that's you know halfway in the middle of the solution, being bound to a controller that's at the very bottom of my solution or, or whatever else. And it's really hard to wrangle those things all in one place. Um, but if, if we have a, a kind of common sense organization, like I'm going to add a folder for pages, and then I'm going to add a folder in here for, you know, login, for example. <clears throat> and then adding my uh, view, view model, and whatever other code I need right in here, it's going to be way better to find and to manage and to work on. So. I know, I, like I said, I know I bring that up a lot, but uh, please quit organizing things based off the kind of thing that they are and organize them based off of uh, where they group naturally together. Okay, now my lecture's over. <laughs> Let's see what this thing runs. So uh, in the drop down here, I've got quite a lot. I've got Windows Machine, Android Emulators, iOS, and uh, I don't have Mac OS because you can only do that on a Mac machine. But here we go. Let's run this on a Windows machine. Usually it builds quicker than this. I think it's just because I'm taxing my system resources recording this and stuff. <laughs> I 
Okay, and here it is. I'm gonna shrink it down to be more like a mobile looking thing. But uh, we click on here and it says clicked and we've got a home tab. And if I click here, <clears throat> if you're familiar with WPF, these are just kind of some things to help. Um, but we can, like for example, it'll show you binding failures and it'll show you uh, the visual tree and all the things that are inside of it. So it's kind of kind of neat. Uh, and I want to show you something. So I'm gonna try and get both on the screen at the same time here. Hot reload has come a long way. So here we are. I'm going to change um, change this text here. I'm gonna say, you know. Hello, new nug. You see, like, as I am typing, you can see it updating over here, right? As I add new characters, you can see what's going on. I haven't even saved it yet. In fact, I can undo it, <laughs> and it pops back the way it was. And it's not just changing content of labels either. I can add whole new controls, like let me add another button. That's not how you do that. <laughs> yeah, and um, and it's just kind of already there. Uh, one of the th reasons I think I'm so excited about this though is that because it really does render cross-platform to, to Windows as well, even if I'm only interested in making a iOS and Android version of the app, this is going to save me loads of time over the emulators and the simulators. But since the simulators here, or sorry, the emulators, an Android emulator, let's run to it and see, see what that looks like. So I'm gonna get rid of my button for a minute and I'm gonna tell it to run on, what's the name of that emulator? Looks like we've got it built and we just need to get it running. There we go. See our nice splash screen, which I'll show you where that comes from in a second. And here is the same app. And here we click it and it goes. You'll notice though, <clears throat> with this one, when I click it, you know, it does the, uh, the I don't know how well you can see it over the zoom, but it kind of has an, a bubble effect that turns lighter purple as it goes where from wherever I clicked. If I click over here or I click in the middle, you can kind of see that effect, right? That's because this is a native Android button. It's not a control that's rendered to look like a button and works kind of like a button, but it isn't actually an Android button. No, this is an Android button. So it's kind of helpful that way. Um, so I also want to show you, uh, we can run this on iOS. I'm not gonna be able to show you it running on iOS, but uh, here we go, iPhone 13 and go. What this is gonna do is <clears throat> send this work over to the build Mac via SSH and it's going to build and invoke it in the simulator. And normally, <clears throat> I'd be able to see the simulator here, but because of a bug, I've had to turn that off. Uh, I have to dis disable the remote simulator to Windows. Otherwise, this is a really neat uh, development experience for iOS. iOS has always been more difficult, but um, this has really kind of helped a lot. Unfortunately, a lot of the work I'm doing right now involves uh, Bluetooth and, you know, one of the things you can't simulate is Bluetooth. 
but yeah, I mean, this is kind of a kind of a neat little setup here. So let's um, let's now do. I want to go back to the Windows machine. I want to run again. There's another thing I want to point out. And I'm sorry, it's going to be a little bit obnoxious. <laughs> okay, so here's my app. Dismiss that. Pain. I'm going to open up Narrator and I'm going to click in the app. Alert, alert, info. There's an update available. Visual, Visual Studio, Studio Code 1.67.1. 1. 1. 1. 1. Desktop, Desktop child side bridge pane. Click, click me, button. Counts, counts the number of times, times you click. Click, click one, one time. time. Click, click two times. times. Click, click three times. times. Click, click four times. Okay, so I'm gonna turn this off and I'm gonna explain narrator, what's going on here. Exiting narrator. So those are um, accessibility options. So you'll notice when I clicked on the button, it said counts the number of times you click. And each time I clicked the button, I was able to use this uh, reader to re announce that the text has changed. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with uh, with this kind of technology. This is compatible with screen readers and things like that. But there's, some been, there's been some rulings in the federal courts recently that seem to indicate that every business is meant to be ADA compliant such that they are compatible with these technologies. It's not just the federal government that has to make sure that their stuff works for disabled. Um, every company has to make sure their stuff works for disabled people. Um, of course, that's there's limited scope here that we're talking um, external customer facing apps more than, you know, internal business apps. And I think 80% of the code most of us write is, you know, internal business app type stuff. But it's really a good idea to get in the habit of uh, using the this uh, announce you can do more than that as well. But uh, and making sure that all the semantic properties are here. So like even here, I've got heading levels and descriptions, and all these are able to be picked up by the screen reader. All right, and let's see, there was another thing I was gonna cover. Shell, okay. Um, the, the shell is kind of an interesting component it gives us a lot of things pretty easily, um, but it hadn't been very customizable in Xamarin. So there's an analogous component called the Xamarin Forms shell, and it does very similar things, um, and is probably pretty compatible with what's uh, on the Xamarin side. But uh, in Xamarin, we didn't have as rich of WPF support as we do now in Maui. And so if you use the shell, you might have to settle with, I can only have uh, X number of buttons show at a time, or I can't put a glyph with those buttons, or you know those kinds of problems. Uh, those are problems we've had with, with the Xamarin shell, and we've steered away from it for most projects because of those reasons. However, with Maui, I'm guess I think I believe the shell is probably much uh, much more refined. Obviously, I haven't been able to you know use this in production yet. And if I if this changes, I will be the first to post in our Slack <laughs> that no, don't use the shell. It sucks. Um, but the shell is kind of interesting. You'll notice it's got this kind of route property. Again, this keys off of the routes that were um, previously set up in the in the project and uh, I can do all kinds of things in the shell I can do flyout menus from the left I can do flyouts from the right I can do bottom tabs I can do you know all kinds of cool things um, 
See what else is there? Different layouts. Different swipe gestures, hamburger buttons. You know, yeah, that's all in here. It's kind of neat. Okay, so that's that's our simple app example. Uh, do we have any questions at this point? Cool. Uh, I do have one question. Yeah, we've got one. Yeah. Um, I know Microsoft has said that they're not going to do Linux support for this, but you just off the top of your head, you know if there are any community projects extending it to keep up with Linux that are keeping pace with the official releases? That's a fantastic question. Unfortunately, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I'll do some research, I guess. Then. Thank you. I think it would be uh, pretty neat to see this work in Linux as well. So hopefully you find the answer that we're looking for. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay. We've got another question over here. Yep. So what are the chances of you, the Windows version compiling to a EXE that's XCopy deployable? It is XCopy deployable. I'll show you. You don't need I've to got... go through the Windows Store and stuff? You don't have to do that, no. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. So uh, I, I clicked on the publish button, and when my computer kind of catches up with me, it should show me the dialog. <laughs> but I have the same exact options for my Maui app as I have for any other .NET 6 app. So I can do portable code, I can do platform specific code, I can do architecture specific code, I can do um, the framework bundled in with it, I can do all those things. Um, because I have the exact same, did I say pack or publish? I think I might have hit pack. <laughs> oh, no, I don't Azure. Ah, come on, folder. No, sorry. I do want to show this. this is, that's a great question. Okay, so yeah, I can change. Anything that I would have changed about the uh, a regular .NET 6 app, I can change it here, and it'll run. So you can do the single file with self-contained and trim, and I want it to run on, you know, Probably not win art. I don't know. It's <laughs> just win 64, you know, ready to, and do ready to run. All these things are available to us because these are all just .NET 6 things. So anything .NET 6 can do, we can do as well. Um, the uh, In terms of the Windows Store apps, uh, these days they're not really built any differently anymore. It, I mean, obviously it used to be that Win32 apps couldn't be in the Windows Store. I don't know if you remember, but a couple years ago they, they lifted that ban and now a Windows Store app is just another way to deliver your app. It doesn't have to be anything special. So does that answer your question? Yes. Cool. We've got another one here. Okay. You showed when you ran the Windows version there were some controls at the top. Are those just developer tools? Or yeah, are those are just the developer tools. You get those for the Windows version. You don't get them so much for the other version, but they still right. work. So for example, if I am brave enough to try this again on the Android emulator, I should be able to use that same visual component um, tool. I just can't use the neat little thing where I can say, I wanna see that tool and have it, oops. <laughs> Shouldn't have actually. Hit my thing. I want to see you know this component and have it you know fly to it in the visual tree. I've got this running over here on Android, right? And I've got my Visual Tree Explorer here, and you can see we can see exactly where uh, or the how each of the things are inside here. And if I click this neat little button here, it'll take me straight to that component. So there's that label. There's that content page. Yeah, pin this so it doesn't go away. You know, there's that image. Um, and then it's even got properties that you can show about the current live current tree. Um, and then since we're here though, I want to show, where's that hello world? 
Is that live visual tree that reflects what's currently rendered in the emulator? Is that Correct. Right? That's right. So here's my hello new nug again, this time on the Android emulator. I haven't saved it yet. No, I have. <laughs> you know? So really kind of cool. Okay. Uh, other questions? I'll also point out that most of these are still available here. They're just not in the app. And you missed the one thing of, uh, like, I can't. There's one tool where I can, on Windows, just say, tell me what this button is visually, and it'll pop it to where it is on the code. That's not available on the other platforms, but it's not a biggie. Okay, let's go back to the slides for just a minute. Make sure I hit everything here. Okay, um, let's do a Blazor app example. So I'm going to close this solution. Create new project. This time I'm going to create a .NET MAUI Blazor app. We call it MAUI. Blazor app, so it doesn't conflict anywhere. <laughs> okay, now you'll notice this one looks a bit different, right? Because it's kind of making the assumption that really the only thing you want if you've done a file new Blazor app, the only thing you really want in here is actual Blazor. So uh, it's made that assumption for you, and so long as you're okay with that assumption, it's fine. If you're not okay with that, that assumption, no biggie. All you have to do is add a dependency for, I can't remember what it is, microsoft.aspnet.components.webview.maui. <clears throat> if you add this pa uh, NuGet package to an existing project, then uh, you'll need to do the add uh, Maui Blazor web view part here. And once you've done that, you'll need to add a namespace and then you can use the web view component and you can have it as just a, a smaller part of a bigger app. But like I said, because we said we wanted a new uh, Maui Blazor app, uh, it's going Blazor, okay, oops. <laughs> Uh, it's going to assume that we just kind of want the, the app to be the whole thing. So let's look at this main page at XAML. And here we go. Here's that Blazor web view I was uh, telling you about. <clears throat> and we need a host page. That is found right here. If you're familiar with Blazor, this is just the boilerplate stuff. And then we need a root component selector saying that the app is really a main component, local main. I don't know why it couldn't go there, but it's this guy. <laughs> so let's try this. Okay, and if you've ever worked with Blazor, you will recognize this page immediately because it's the exact same page that you get for when you create a new Blazor app. And it works exactly the same here. In this way, I would say this is more analogous to something like um, Electron, but it does run natively and it doesn't have to run JavaScript. So it does have a performance advantage. Hey, uh, question. Yeah. yeah. Do Razor pages work in there? I see there's a pages folder. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to repeat that. It didn't come through. Do Razor pages work? Yeah. I think there's a, a pages folder in your project. 
Yeah. These are all Razor pages. Those are Razor components. You know, the CS HTML. Razor views, I guess. Okay. Uh, so what is it you're wanting to see though? I Just a, a not a component, but an actual whole page? Yeah, like a CS HTML page, you know, the MVC stuff. That's all in, in this stuff. So uh, let me show you. Like in the counter, uh, here's our code. And the on click is going to call this increment count, increment count, increments the count. It's going to re-render the count up here. I mean, this is this is much of a page as it, as it gets. using a master page. Well, probably. Okay, so this is, yeah, it's using the master pages, the, the router, and then we're probably using main layout, and then doing the body. Yeah, I mean, this is all, this is the entire Razor stack, or sorry, entire Blazor stack. Including the service, uh, getting the, the, the data from the service which is just faking, but um, one thing I want to did want to show you while this is running though. Now I have to wait for it again, sorry. Okay, so we've got our components, our debug tools here still, and they do work with this. It's just a deeper visuals tree. Kind of stops right here, but then uh, if we go, so let's, oop, darn it. <laughs> network, let's look at this network tab for a moment here. And I'm gonna kind of F5 this guy. And you'll see I've got, all of these calls to 0.0.0.0 .0 and it seems to be getting a response back even though this is obviously not an IP address and what's going on here is this is just how they're plumbing in things like your style sheet and other resources if you didn't have this as a resource it might try and make a web call um, and web calls would be allowed as long as you don't have internet but everything else is just kind of loaded via this mechanism, which is kind of cool. Uh, you also know I can still do all the debugging stuff I would normally do in Chrome. So, all right. Oops, okay, so let's close that again. Let's finish off with the slides then. <clears throat> what is it this all missing? Um, some people say, well, we're missing a XAML designer. I, uh, I don't really necessarily agree there. We've had really great XAML designers in the past with um, Blend and even inside of Visual Studio. The problem is that the designer uh, doesn't have enough contextual information to do a good job in organizing and rendering your components. It's just easier if we just type it in and then we can see it. And that's exactly what the hot reload does for us. So I think the reason we don't have anything like a XAML designer for this is because we have a great hot reload. And this is also kind of analogous to other platforms like uh, React Native or Flutter. There's no designers for those either, but you have a live you have live feedback as you're ch making changes, so you can see, you know, if if what you're doing is what you want. Uh, what else is missing? Well, you'll notice I didn't do anything proper MVVM. I can't find an MVVM framework that's compatible with this yet. 
Um, here at Mindfire, we do have a Mindfire Xamarin uh, MVVM framework that we use for most of our apps. It will probably become Mindfire.maui and or Mindfire.mvvm.maui or something like that. But um, we, we do plan on recreating the functionality there so we can have you know proper MVVM frameworks compatibility. No components available in NuGet yet, as far as I can tell. Um, there's no composition framework like Prism. I don't know if anyone's ever used Prism for WPF. It's a really great framework that allows you to compose different parts of your application without having to have knowledge of other parts. Um, <clears throat> there's no, nothing like that for uh, Maui yet. <clears throat> uh, there's no plugin frameworks yet, but I think in balance, we get a lot more uh, from this than we uh, we would otherwise. And, th and this is the first class debugging experience just can't be topped. Um, I mean, I, as someone who does a lot of other kinds of, of development, the development story behind this stuff is so good <laughs> compared to the competition. Anyway, all right, so I think that's pretty much what I've got. Are there other questions? Any, any other questions? Would you say that the IntelliSense in your, uh, uh, in your XAML editor is pretty great? It's very good, very, very good. That was a simple answer. Any other questions? <laughs> what did they find on 1.0? Can you repeat that a little louder? When are they planning on final release? Oh, so we are in um, release candidate mode, and they did say they're going to release second quarter of 2022. So I think it's going to be any day now. But my guess, if I put money on it, they're going to wait probably to June, maybe maybe early June. They put it off quite a while. I imagine they'll wait as long as long as they can. Yeah, it's pretty solid though. I've played with it for a, a week now or so, and I can tell you, I I'd be comfortable moving stuff to it now. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope uh, hope this has been a great uh, little resource to get you going on on uh, a Maui app and answered questions or giving you a perspective on how I might actually use it. So hopefully that uh, I'll see you guys start using it soon. Thanks, Nate. Thanks. Thanks.